China has not changed its position, neither on Ukraine nor on Taiwan. And yet, China is trying to win friends. Can mutual trust be established again? China has so far refused to criticize Russia for its war in Ukraine. It remains adamant on the Taiwan issue as well. This handshake seemed like a gesture to revive diplomacy. Xi Jinping received Blinken personally. But the ties are so fraught that re-establishing stability looks far-fetched. Meanwhile, in Germany, Chancellor Olaf Scholz repeated his appeal to China to use its influence on Russia to help end the war, an appeal that was blatantly ignored. So, on to the point, we are asking China's global ambitions. Can the West keep up? Hello and welcome to To The Point. I'm Isha Bhatia Sanan here in Berlin. It has been a week of visits. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited China, while Chinese Premier Li Qiang made his first foreign trip to Germany and France. Whether these visits could be called successful, to understand that, I have three wonderful guests with me today. We have John Kampfner. He's an author, broadcaster, and has worked with various media houses and also writes for international publications on global affairs. Next on the panel, we have Deutsche Welle's chief international editor, Richard Walker, with us. And last but not least, we have Katrin Kluver Ashbrock. She is a political scientist. She has worked for CNN as a TV journalist and she continues to write for various international publications on foreign and security policy. A very warm welcome to you all. Thanks for joining. Richard, I mentioned two visits, but there's been a third one as well. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to the US. Just a coincidence, timing-wise, or is it part of a bigger strategy? Yeah, well, I mean, I think we, the timing is maybe coincidental, but obviously, you know, a state visit to the United States takes a very long time to organise. Um, and Tony Blinken's visit to China is something that, that has also been kind of long in the making. Um, but, uh, but I mean, Modi's visit to the US is certainly seen as a, as a very important visit. Um, certainly a lot, of, uh, a lot of symbolism in that. The United States is really trying to reach out to India as what it sees as a potential partner in trying to manage the risks around, around China in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a, a, a week that's absolutely packed with diplomacy, I, you almost don't know where to begin on that. But, but yeah, the Modi trip is certainly something we're going to be watching very closely here. Catherine, just a day after Blinken uh, visited Beijing, Biden referred to Xi Jinping as a dictator. Now, on the one hand, he's provoking China, and on the other hand, he's welcoming Modi with open arms. What kind of message is he trying to send out? Well, I think on the diplomacy piece, this is classic triangulation in diplomacy. I mean, you have seen, if you were to attribute anything to the West that would look like a coherent strategy, it would be that the West has tried very hard to focus on the BICS part of the BRICS, which is to say uh, eliminating Russia from that equation, which is, you know, beyond a pariah in the international system, but has tried very hard at least to be reaching out to different parts of that constellation. Emmanuel Macron is talking to Brazil's President Lula, sort of as we as we speak. Um, you know, we're thinking wholeheartedly, at least in the West, or attempting to, about how we address the true issues of the global South. And India has been very specific. You know, it has an enormous economy to run, and it has certain Certain needs, and unless those needs are met, you know, this Indian leadership has been very pragmatist. And so that's what it's looking for from its various Western interlocutors. And the West has to lean in because, of course, yes, the threats of China and Russia are consistently in the offing. But to the Biden piece, um, we have to contextualize where Joe Biden was when he said what he said. I think for the wider diplomatic arena, probably not a great move. And yet it, we have to see that he was at a campaign event. He was at a campaign event for his re-election only a few hours effectively after it was revealed that China has a built or is building a spy hub uh, in Cuba and is potentially investing in military training of uh, Cuban military personnel. Uh, one might say in a quid pro quo 
move of the Americans leaning increasingly into their military aid for Taiwan, and at the same time, Congress announcing uh, it wants to do more for Taiwan. So in as much as there's the global international diplomatic picture, there's also domestic pressures on this president. Uh, just and a, the elections. Exactly. Just, you know, 15, 14 months ahead of a major U.S. election. A lot of players here, John. Now, the body language between Blinken and Xi Jinping on the one hand and Modi and Biden on the other hand is also being discussed a lot. What do you make of it? At the heart of all of this is this whole question of pivot states. In other words, there's obviously the Western approach to Russia as an, as, as an immediate acute threat. There is the longer-term strategic piece, which is how do we deal with China, which we'll be discussing. But the third part, which is less discussed, are all the states that are emerging and are absolutely important counterweights uh, to the West on the one side, to China on the other. These are states that are multi-aligned um, uh, in terms of... It's not that they haven't decided are they throwing in their lot with the West or China. They are simply standing up and saying, you've got to talk to us, you have to engage us, and we will work with whoever we want to work with on the basis of our own national interest, which is why, as you said in your introduction, the Modi visit to the US was so important because the West has basically taken a view that Modi is the bulwark against China, perhaps the most important or one of the most important. The West is now prepared to pretty much turn a blind eye to Modi's authoritarian tendencies within India. They're going to do the same with Erdogan, re-elected in, in Turkey, um, and other states as well. It's a question of we're dealing with, we being uh, the Western mindset, is dealing with a world that is very different to the one that appeared to be the case only a few years ago. Talking of Modi's visit, this is Modi's sixth visit to the US since taking over as prime minister in 2014. But his first state visit to the US. Meanwhile, no US Secretary of State has been to China since 2018. And in spite of both sides claiming that they want to reduce friction, their strategic assessments of each other remain unchanged. Chinese President Xi receiving U.S. Secretary of State Blinken in Beijing. They are on speaking terms again, and according to Xi, more than that. The two sides have also made progress and reached agreement on some specific issues. This is very good. More passenger flights between the U.S. and China more visas for students and business people, a reciprocal visit to Washington by China's foreign minister, small steps, but the large conflicts remain, including commercial disputes with reciprocal sanctions, Xi's proximity to warlord Putin, Beijing's aggressive military threats to democratically ruled Taiwan, and Chinese territorial claims in the South China Sea. Most recently, there were dangerous confrontations between Chinese and U.S. fighter jets there in May. And Blinken cannot report that the two militaries are speaking directly to each other again. At this moment, uh, China has not agreed to move forward with that. Um, I think that's an issue that we have to keep working on. China and America. How tense is the relationship between these superpowers? John, tensions between China and U.S. Now, the relations are at the lowest right now. Is enough being done to revive it? Well, as we were talking about Biden and his remarks about um, Xi being a dictator, you never quite know whether Biden means to say what he says or whether he misspeaks. So I don't know whether that was just the, the adrenaline of the campaign trail. But uh, the U.S. And, and Europe have been toying with how to deal, uh, deal with China, haven't worked out both within themselves and between themselves how to do it. Uh, Germany far more uh, exposed to China in terms of trade, as, is, as are most European countries. And in all the different strategic reviews, Germany having just published its, uh, its one only a few days ago and other countries, the description of China ranges from an acute threat to a strategic rival, to a strategic competitor, to a partner, to all kinds of things. And the reason people don't know how to describe it is because they don't know how to deal with China and, and the carrot and the stick. Completely in contrast to Russia, 
now that Western countries have pretty much removed their exposure to China's, uh, to Russia's oil and gas, there is no reason to need to engage with Russia economically. Russia is a, is a spent force. It doesn't have a political model that anybody particularly wants to emulate. It has brute force and it has uh, nuclear weapons. But beyond that, there is no Russian appeal. China is completely different. The West is utterly dependent on China for certain natural resources and raw materials. Supply chains are so interwoven that it's very difficult. People are trying to onshore, to nearshore, to friendshore, to use the terms, to be less dependent on China. But look at Germany's automotive industry, look at so many countries' economies. So how do you work out this, this, this threat versus opportunity question? That's what everybody is trying to do. But America's uh, position on Taiwan has not changed. And yet Blinken found the need to say it again, that we do not support independence in Taiwan. Why was that required? Well, the, the Chinese position on Taiwan towards the United States is essentially saying to them, you say that you have what, what the Chinese call a one-China principle, or the Americans call a one-China policy, which is, which is um, saying that they recognize uh, the People's Republic of China as, as the, the legitimate government over China, that they do not recognize Taiwan as an independent state. Um, but the Americans say what well, absolutely essential is to their policy on this whole thing is that there must be no uh, unilateral attempt to change the status quo and particularly not by force. Um, and I think the reason why Blinken and also we've heard this from Joe Biden also when um, he took part in the G20 summit in Bali when he actually met Xi Jinping the last time, um, reiterating that position in public because the, the Chinese are saying, well, actually, this is what you ostensibly mean, but you're salami slicing that. You're providing weapons, more and more weapons to the Taiwanese. And Joe Biden has also, in various comments where there's also been interpretation about was it a spur of the moment thing or was it a really intentional thing, has on various occasions in the last couple of years said that if the Chinese were to attack Taiwan, then the United States would definitely come to Taiwan's aid. That goes beyond official US policy. And whenever he's said that, then the, the administration has usually walked the comment back within the space of 24 hours or so. And the Chinese, when they look at this, they say, you're, you're salami slicing your, um, your policy. You say that you believe in one China, um, but in reality, you're providing weapons, you're providing more and more political support to Taiwan, for instance, with the visit of the, uh, of the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, to Taiwan last year, which caused, which was one of the, the, you know, the things that unleashed this extremely sour period in US-China relations. Um, so that's why Blinken is, is saying that when he's in Beijing. Yeah. Then how do you think US would react if China were to use military action in Taiwan? Well, I mean, hopefully we're some way away from that. But of course, I think what the United States and the world has been confronted with, with uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, is it, it's made even clearer that something that's been thought of as a sort of a theoretical possibility uh, for many years, because actually China has always said that it reserves the right to take Taiwan by force, now, Vladimir Putin has gone ahead with a full-scale invasion against Ukraine. Uh, this just makes that, that prospect seem all the more um, conceivable. Um, there's a debate, though, about whether China, looking at what's happening in Ukraine, might be thinking, OK, you know, they might be learning lessons about how to, how to do it, or they might be getting dissuaded from doing it because they see how difficult it is. Um, they see the the huge ramp up in sanctions and the and the, the relative unity of the West in, in facing up to this. So thinking about what the consequences could be for, for China if they mounted uh, some sort of invasion of that, and will also be confronted even more with I think the, the 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 greater difficulties to take Taiwan compared to invading Ukraine, given that Taiwan is an island. You know, so there. Are, um, so whether whether it's more or less likely is one question, but it certainly confronted everybody, not just the Americans, but also the, the Europeans with the reality that, well, this could happen one day. And both of them, Biden and G, uh, Xi Jinping, they will be face to face in G20 in September and later in APEC. Do you think they would be able to take things forward? 
Well, I think that's certainly what the Americans are hoping. Um, we heard in Bali that what they wanted to prepare was a thaw uh, in diplomatic relations, and at least we have to get back to a modicum of steady exchange. So the idea was that the preparation of the Blinken visit, of course, uh, which was supposed to happen in February, and you'll remember that the spy balloon incident interceded, uh, and that a specific readout on both sides um, made that situation very volatile, at least diplomatically. Um, but you had quite some preparation for this Blinken visit, ultimately. You had a visit by uh, CIA chief Bill Burns. You had conversations with uh, by Jake Sullivan, uh, the head of the uh, National Security uh, Committee, uh, the NSC in Washington, with his counterpart in Geneva. Uh, so science kind of set the tone. And the Americans have pegged an agenda item very clearly, which is that we come again to a point where we have military to military exchanges because the situation over the past few months, and we heard it in the piece, has become increasingly volatile. It's not just been uh, sort of uh, increasingly Incursions in airspace or where American um, uh, jets and Chinese jets have encountered one another. That's not just happened once, but a few times. The same thing is true uh, sort of in the maritime uh, arena and the navies coming too close to one another and not an ability to interface with one, one another very directly. So it's very clear that now this potentially, even this visit, even despite the Biden comments, opens the doors for what is planned and already on the docket, which is that Janet Yellen, the head of the Fed, is supposed to have interaction actions with the Chinese. Uh, John Kerry, the head climate envoy of the United States, is supposed to have very substantive talks uh, with their with his Chinese counterpart. Uh, and then, of course, Gina Raimondo on the trade questions, which are, I think, vital between the two. And in as much as Richard uh, and John pointed out um, how dependent the Europeans still are on the Chinese market, of course, uh, the export-import relationship between China and the United States, you know, remains pegged at number three. Big, big American businesses still in China. And so finding a modicum of of true diplomacy, even trade diplomacy, uh, is vital. But, you know, one thing, I was at a, a policy makers um, retreat at the end of last week, Germans, Americans and Brits, and one scenario was, was mooted that really surprised me. And it was less the Chinese military action invasion of Taiwan, uh, the argument being, would China want to attack Chinese? And uh, that whole sense of maybe we are, to coin a phrase, jumping the gun on, on that. The more immediate and intriguing and worrying scenario is if Putin is forced back in Ukraine, and at the moment the Ukrainians are making very little advance as far as we are aware, but were the Ukrainians really to break through and Putin be on the back foot, would the Chinese provide direct military assistance to Russia, something they have steered well clear of until now. And were they to do that, the Americans would be required, one would imagine, to impose sanctions on right. China. And, and it's that sort of next step. Taiwan still feels, maybe wrong, a while away or more in the distance, but this is Right on our doorstep. But I think that was the substance of the closed door conversation that Olaf Scholz had with Joe Biden uh, a couple months ago in the White House. And you remember that was very much, uh, you know, a, a closed door, eye to eye, potentially come to Jesus moment, where I very much assume that the <laughs> American president would have said something mm. to that effect. Uh, to the German chancellor, which is to say, it is time for you to prepare your industries um, for what a sanctions regime, and mm. Richard made the point, it was in, in you know comparative terms easy to wean yourself off a quote-unquote one-track pony, mm. uh, you know, in the energy sector in Russia. And it, as hard as that was, you know, let's, let's be honest, uh, but comparatively to everything that we've said about rare earth minerals, um, batteries, the, the kind of things that are vital to our everyday lives around the world, um, that's going to be a whole different gambit. And to sequence that correctly, you'd hope that some of the strategies that we're not seeing, you mentioned the national security strategy on the German side, is playing that out very directly. But that's not at all the image you got when you studied what was going on this past week in Berlin when the cabinet delegation from the Chinese side met with their counterparts uh, here from the German government. Right. We'll come to Germany now. It seems to be a balancing act between diplomatic and economic ties. So while Blinken tried to improve diplomatic ties, Chinese Premier worked on boosting economic ties with Germany. Chancellor Scholz has emphasized that Germany is not interested in economic decoupling from China. While visiting Berlin, China had the reins in hand. No questions from journalists were allowed. 
Premier Li and Chancellor Scholz stressed the importance of dialogue despite the differences. Their focus was clearly on the economy. If we continue to strengthen our cooperation in science, technology and trade, we will contribute to the stability of the world economy. Schultz demanded fair competition from Beijing and urged compliance with labor standards and human rights in supply chains. But I often say it and stressed it again today with my colleague Li. We have no interest in economic decoupling from China. Instead, Germany wants to become more independent of its most important trading partner. But the strategy known as de-risking was not high on the Chancellor's agenda, to the annoyance of his Green Party coalition partner. Schultz managed to get the Chinese state shipping company Costco to invest in a Hamburg container terminal, that is, in critical infrastructure. In which direction is the new German-China strategy headed? Richard, the Chinese Premier refused to take questions during the press conference. Did you have a deja vu moment? I remember we were there in the press conference when Modi visited Berlin. Well, it wasn't just the Chinese Premier who refused to take questions. Olaf Scholz did too. There were no questions. Um, and but yeah, it can't be one side. The, 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 yeah, and and but, they said that it was because of the Chinese side that they refused uh, to take the questions. Yeah, but but the the Germans rolled off, rolled over on that demand. It was the same when Modi and came. And it was the same when Narendra Modi was in Berlin last year. And I think, yeah, it, it, a day dangerous precedent was set uh, during that Modi visit because, of course, it, it, you know, it gives the Chinese cover to say, well, you know, if you don't have to take questions with Modi, why should we answer questions? Um, so, yeah, there was a certain amount of kind of quiet uh, outrage among the, the, the journalists there. And we'll have to see if the journalists could try to summon up some unity to, uh, to, um, to make more of a stand uh, next time something like this happens. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was quite a notable um, press conference, partly because or, or, or they called it a sort of an encounter with the press. There was no conference happening, of course. But how low-key it was, it felt a little bit like a flashback, not just to Modi, but also to the Merkel years when these government consultations were brought in. And just to take a moment to stress what they are, I mean, it's not just a meeting between the Chancellor and their counterpart. This is whole of government consultation. So the, the Chinese came along with, with nine ministers uh, and, and heads of, of, of various um, uh, bureaucracies. The Germans had eight ministers in, in addition to Olaf Scholz. So a, a wide-ranging kind of engagement between the two governments. And this is something that Angela Merkel brought in during her time. And that was a time where the, the Germany went full speed ahead on, on engagement with China and built up very significant economic ties, particularly between its very biggest companies, its car companies, its industrial giants and China. Um, exposing them to the Chinese market to a great extent now. So a lot of this discussion now about this idea of taking the risk out of the relationship, de-risking, this is a question about the exposure of Ch some of Germany's most powerful companies to that market. But talking of de-risking, John, Scholz seems to have a different definition of de-risking as compared to the rest of G7. Is the West not united? Uh, it's not united. Um, and the reason Schultz has that divergence is, as Richard says, because Germany is so exposed. It uh, de-risking is a, is a suitably vague term to, to minimise the risk. One positive aspect that Germany and other European countries are doing is looking for looking more assiduously at other party, uh, partners in Asia. Um, and the considerably closer ties, we've, we've talked, of, of course, about India, but also Japan uh, is much uh, more of an important player. The US, the, um, the UK uh, and uh, Japan um, uh, very much with Australia, <clears throat> which is a, a really big player now in, in all of this, um, much, much closer on a, a lot of these issues. So these are shifting sands. But Germany has always, Germany's entire... Um, post-unification, indeed post-war, post-Wirtschaftswunder economic miracle model is based on uh, high-end goods and, and exports. And Germany is absolutely the past master of that. And it's, uh, it's on that that this country's uh, post-war wealth is built. And that is why the risk is so much greater. Catherine, you'd mentioned uh, the meetings with CEOs earlier. Now, both the Chinese Premier and the Indian Prime Minister have been meeting CEOs in Germany and USA, respectively. They seem to be competing with each other to get West attention. 
So final thoughts, India or China, who's going to be the more important partner in Asia in the future? Oh, I think it's all a question of time. I think very much the, the Germans and the rest of the West would like to see India step up to the plate and push on some of the high-tech pieces. I think the, the EU-India TTC, the Tech and Technology, Tech, Technology Council, is right in that gambit. But for now, and I think John raises an important point, it's all about time. De-risking takes time. And if a huge American defense manufacturer like Raytheon says, we can't pull out of China quickly, that's just as true for all the German um, manufacturers. And now what we need to see is the German businesses need to learn from their SME counterparts, the other things that have made Germany strong economically, because they are very nimble players here. But the big ones need time to prepare to get out. And I think that's where the hard truth is going to meet rubber and road. China, the world's second largest economy, is becoming increasingly influential economically, militarily, and geopolitically. The question that is defining this century is whether the West can keep up with China's global ambitions. What do you think about it? If you're watching us on YouTube, do let us know your thoughts. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.